Charles Eisenstein is an author and a speaker who is making waves in the face of medical control. In his essay, Mob Morality and the Unvaxxed, he explains how capital punishment first originated in the practice of human sacrifice. He raises concerns about the demonization of people who are unvaccinated for COVID-19 and analyzes the patterns of scapegoating and fanaticism throughout much of the world's history, from the witch trials to the Holocaust to 9-11. His ancestors are Russian and Polish Jews, and his lineage in part sensitizes him to dehumanization in all forms. When people today who are unvaccinated or who have been injured by a vaccine speak out, their needs to be widely seen, heard, and believed are not met. Rather, they are dismissed and dehumanized, even wished dead. In this interview with Charles, we talk about how the delusion of dehumanization may cloud one's ability to see the truth. We talk about the grip of vaccine mandates, quarantine camps, and censorship. Charles explains the origins of the left's identification with science as an institution, and the assumptions built into progressivism that progress is deeply linked with scientific technological ambition. We also discuss why following the science has become a secular religion of sorts, with the ritual being vaccination in order to be granted inclusion into society. Acknowledging the threat of persecution, Charles has a potent perspective about why courage is a group project and how we might break free from the old story of separation for good. He calls for a deeper kind of revolution, a revolution of disclosure. If you feel like a heretic of our time or are curious to understand that role, this episode is for you. I'm Sienna May Heath, and this is Leaving the Left for Liberty. Hello. Hi, Charles. Hi. How Hi. are you? Good. You must be Sienna, yes? I am Sienna, yes. Happy Char to meet you. Happy to meet you too. Really, it's a blessing. Thank you. Thank you for gathering with me today. Yeah. Looking, yeah. Been looking forward to it. Me too. Uh, so as you've recently spoken to, our country is in a crisis of conversation. Um, I think recently you might have said the crisis of the word. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing to open up the conversations that need to be had and co-create a better world, um, which is a big undertaking. Um, and I think many are still suppressing the truth as they see it, and understandably so, because they're afraid. Um, but you are one of the rising many who is stepping out um, and speaking out, I think, on a variety of controversial issues, but two that I want to focus on today being the dehumanization of anyone, um, but particularly the dehumanization of people who are unvaccinated for COVID and also on the topic of the grip of medical control. And I'm really curious what this journey has been like for you in 2020 and 2021 during the pandemic, when did you feel like it was your cue to step out and do something that might be considered brave? Yeah, so right at the beginning, like in March, I think uh, I, I think I published at the end of March, I wrote an article that I didn't really know was brave. I didn't expect that I would like it was called the coronation and it went into a lot of the themes that I've revisited and explored expanded on over the last year and a half. Uh, but a lot of it was about like even then talking about medical totalitarianism, uh, the idea that once we stepped into um, once we gave our political power away to medical authorities or to political authorities who drew on medical authorities and bypassed democratic mechanisms, it wouldn't be easy to get it back again because the justifications or the pretexts that they were using aren't gonna go away. Disease will always be with us. I said, there could be new viruses. You know, now we're calling them variants. Um, and, and so like, I just blurted it all out, um, uh, talked a lot about, um, death phobia, the denial of death, talked about 
the paradigm of control. Like I went, you know, went, went pretty philosophical, but also quite specific about um, fear, hysteria. And I was um, denounced for that article pretty intensely uh, and called a, you know, QAnon, Trump supporting adjacent conspiracy theorists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so I, I, I continued writing some, but at some point the um, criticism kind of got under my skin and I'm like, okay, am I sure that I'm not just acting out some defiant pattern against my father and they're, they're therefore gravitating toward sources of information that justify my, my defiant attitude? Am I really being objective? How, how can I be sure? And so I kind of hibernated uh, on the issue for probably about eight months and didn't really write on COVID related topics, partly because I had to be sure that I'm not just killing people, you know, and partly because I was afraid. And maybe those two are related. And at some point then in 2021, I stepped back out again and began writing from the perspective of this philosopher, Rene Girard, who talked about sacrificial violence, scapegoating, dehumanization, and all that kind of stuff. And, and it culminated in an essay called Mob Morality and the Unvaxxed. And that's when I put that out there. This time I knew from experience that I was probably gonna get in, in trouble. And I was, I, I did get in trouble and got you know publicly denounced by my own publisher and by people who had been, uh, who I'd considered dear friends and allies and kicked off various platforms and you know denounced as an anti-Semite. And then people would, other programs I was on, people would write them and say, well, I don't want to be in a program with the notorious anti-Semite Charles Eisenstein. And like this whole, people asked to distance themselves from me and, and all of this, um, like all of these things that, that confirmed exactly the thesis of, of the essay. And, and at that point, you know, I guess the die was cast. And, and yeah, since then I've been making my home among the other heretics. <laughs> yeah, likewise. And we connected after you released that essay, Mob Morality and the Unvaxxed. Um, and the, the way I, I would sum up, and I would love to hear your sum up of the essay as well, but like the way I would sum it up is, is not so much drawing historical parallels, but more like analyzing the energies and the patterns of dehumanization, scapegoating, and fanaticism. And those patterns are inherently human. Um, and I, I kind of got the sense that the pushback um, was a, a defiance, like they people didn't want to face the darkest part of themselves. Is that is that where you were feeling yeah. too? Um, so the 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 official narrative says that that everything that we are doing to combat COVID is very rational. It's science based. It's definitely not the expression of shadow psychological forces. Uh, we've, we're past all of that stuff. And any uh, comparison that you make between that, between what's going on today and the Holocaust or the witch hunts or anything like that, um, this ancient historical pattern of, of Gerard called it sacrificial violence, is is you know a disingenuous fallacious comparison that dishonors the victims of the witch hunts and the holocaust and the purges and all that kind of stuff um, because we know that we're past that now this is science <laughs> and yeah um what i was saying is that that the same basic psychosocial forces are at play that were at play in the Holocaust, that were at play in the witch hunts that have been with humans for a long time, which basically is 
uh, Gerard said that the greatest threat to society in the early days was cycles of vengeance, reciprocal violence, tit for tat violence, blood feuds that would tear societies apart before they even barely got started. And the solution was to unify society in an act of violence against a sacrificial victim or class of victims who would be ritually dehumanized and then murdered. And because the, um, and, and it, once, once, that, the, once this happened, everybody would be friends again and life would go back to normal. So it seemed to them that because murdering the victim solved the problem, the victim must have been the cause of the problem. So this whole process became memorialized in myth and legend and uh, custom. So, so ultimately, I'm not sure how much history we want to go into here, but mm. but ultimately the the um, the the sacrifice would be done preemptively mm. as in in festivals or um, certain classes or even the king in many societies it was the king would be would be um the king the king would be required to perform heinous acts and violate the most sacred taboos of the tribe in order to concentrate evil in himself preparing then if you know there was a famine or a plague or something you knew what to do the king would be sacrificed Eventually, the king decided that this wasn't maybe the best arrangement. And he said, well, how about this criminal instead? And so that's where capital punishment came from. And it mm -hmm. didn't matter whether the victim was actually guilty. All that needed to happen was that there was an agreement to, to um, uh, expend to the, the, the social rivalries and tensions to defuse them by unifying in violence against somebody. So here we have today, we have um, a society that is riven by rivalry, by polarization, by tension, and, and, and now a plague. Well, the plague itself actually is partly a symptom of the tension because there was so much latent anxiety before COVID happened that, that people, society, and especially the elites needed an enemy. This is, uh, the, the whole Girardian pattern is similar to the pattern of unifying society by finding an external enemy and going to war. I mean, that's always the solution of dictators. Uh, when popular unrest is growing, you manufacture an enemy. So we had the war on terror would be an example of that, that unified the country. And so, you know, 2019, 2020 comes and society is riven by divisions. And now here, and, every, and, and, and anxiety is latent. And now here comes an identifiable enemy that, that we can go to war against and sacrifice to and unify around. And that's the, I think that's one thing that powered the, what I would call hysteria around COVID-19, not that it is nothing or a hoax, but it was certainly a vehicle for a lot of pent up fear that amplified it, that magnified it way beyond its actual objective threat. And then comes the unvaxxed, because here it's still with us, the tensions are still here. So now we find and dehumanize a scapegoat class, uh, regardless of the scientific merit of that. You know, like now we're seeing all kinds of stuff about how the vaccinated can spread the virus too. And I'm sorry to use these words that might get you censored, but but you know that the vaccinated can spread the virus too, and that maybe it's not even very effective and it's causing all this harm. As before, the guilt or innocence of the victim doesn't matter for them to serve the scapegoat role. 
So here we are. That's sorry, I went on and on and on so long, but that's some of the bare bones of it. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, and actually, what you said about the scapegoats not having to be guilty reminded me of a line I wanted to read from your essay. Um, you write, scapegoats need, need, needn't be guilty, but they must be marginal, outcasts, heretics, taboo breakers, or infidels of one kind or another. If they are too alien, they will be unsuitable as transfer objects of in-group aggression. Neither can they be full members of society, lest cycles of vengeance ensue. Yeah, so tell us more about what activated you to write this piece, because it seemed, as you said, you, you really took some time to hibernate. Um, and then what was your breaking point that drove you to write this piece about the hijacking of morality that's happening in the, in, 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 in and around the pandemic, because that's a big topic to tackle. Yeah, I got sick of gaslighting myself, of being so fair-minded that I was like in good faith taking the propaganda as something to actually consider. And, and, and I can understand why, because most of the people parroting the propaganda sincerely believe it. They're not evil, manipulative bullies. You know, they're just um, doing what human beings do, which is that you respect authority. In a normal society, it's good to respect authority. Authority comes from people who have earned respect. In a healthy society. In a healthy society, yeah. yeah. But now this, this healthy human impulse is hijacked by um, powers that do not have the best interest of humans in, at heart or the planet. So, and these powers are like, yeah, they have representatives who embody these powers to an extreme degree, but they are fundamentally systemic. And this is part of the delusion, which is the same delusion as the delusion of a virus that you can solve all your problems by finding the bad guy and destroying the bad guy. So the same mentality is applied to like say, what we call conspiracy theories that, that say the root of the problem is a subset of evil people who are, we basically, it's the same pattern. We dehumanize them, blame them for all of the problems and then gear up to send them off to the guillotine same pattern as is behind COVID mania, no different. Mm -hmm. So what I've been calling for is a deeper kind of revolution where we don't do that anymore. Where we, and that's not to say that there aren't ruthless, manipulative people who are committing heinous acts. That part is true, but are they masterminding the whole system? Are they the deepest explanation I don't think so. I think that they are products of a system. They are opportunistic, just like a virus or a bacteria is better understood as an opportunistic, um, as an opportunist rather than as the cause of disease. But they're attracted maybe to diseased tissue states or to a person ready to go through some kind of initiation or they um, transfer DNA across, there, there's all, oh boy, I'm going in too many directions at once. Let's just say that there are other paradigms through which to understand disease, through which to understand our social and political degeneracy, through which to understand crime, through which to understand terrorism. You know, we tend to blame crime on criminals, terrorism on terrorists, um, gun violence on guns, political evil on evil politicians. Uh, like it's all a war mentality. Mm -hmm. And I got sick of it. And I got sick of, of, maybe I'm saying a contradictory thing here. I mean, I got sick of giving them the benefit of the doubt again and again and again, when I knew this is wrong. It is wrong for children to be masked all day 
and never see a, a smile. It is wrong to be told for a year and a half now that, that we can't hug or sing together. And it, and I am not imagining like the, the censorship, the suppression of adverse event stories, the, the persecution of whistleblowers, like, like, yeah, I could write these off in some way, but come on, Charles, you know what's going on here. So like, it was that crystallization of, of clarity coupled with, I was just sick of playing it safe. And because partly my uncertainty was a smokescreen for cowardice, for playing it safe. And so, you know, bravery comes usually when you're just sick of the confinement of fear. It's, it's, it's you're just fed up with it. And you're just like, I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. 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 And I, I love all the directions you're going in. Um, and uh, one one direction I want to, to touch upon again is the, the concept of unity, because you, you mentioned like, okay, theoretically in this in this system or in these patterns, if we unify against a scapegoat class, then we will have unity. We will we will be free again. We will be happy again. Justice will prevail. But that's not real unity, is it? And that's not unity at all. It's division. It is a kind of a unity, you know. Like everybody gangs up against the Jews. Everybody gangs up. It's like it's like the unity of a mob. You have the ringleaders saying, you know, go lynch that person. You have. Um, uh, a minority of the mob saying, yeah, let's do that. And you have the vast majority of the mob, each one thinking, gosh, I don't think that's a good idea, but I'm alone because nobody's speaking up. Look at all the people shouting. I'd better shout too. Everybody who shouts, yeah, makes it look, gives the appearance of a unanimity that isn't really there. So maybe you're right. It is actually a fake uh, unity that that is maintained just like the emperor's new clothes by a conspiracy of silence and you mm -hmm. just kind of go along with it which to me like that was another thing like I'm like you know I actually have a kind of civic duty to speak out because if I don't speak out who's going to speak out if, if I'm waiting for other people to do it then I am affirming a principle of human nature called waiting for other people to do it. And, and I see this a lot, like even when people are like the tide is turned, people are, um, people are not gonna stand for this any longer. And then the implication of, so we can kind of sit back and watch it happen. No, we can't sit back and watch it happen because then you are basically saying, I'm going to let other people take the risk. Now, I'm not saying that you should take a risk, that you should, you know, lose your job over your medical choice. There's no should here. I recognize that some people have a lot more at stake than others. I don't have a job. I am pretty secure in my support base. Um, like I have a lot less to risk by speaking out than some people do. So I greet that condition with gratitude. You know, like I don't actually have to be as brave as some people in order to speak out. And by doing that, I make it easier for others to be brave too, because I break, I, I contribute to breaking the spell of the appearance of unanimity. Hmm. Yeah, and, and courage can come from gratitude. That was a, a, a nice line you drew that you drew there. Um, and it, it's true, some people have less to risk than others. And I, I respect that. Um, I think many can understand. And it, understand why a whistleblower might come forward perhaps 
they've just reached a point where enough is enough and they're willing to risk everything, or perhaps they just don't have as much to risk as, as some others. Um, I, I loved also that the phrase you said, of, was it the conspiracy of silence? Um, because I, I've noticed, like, as I've sort of swam in some of these alternative spaces, it is a conspiracy of silence because there's a lot going on underground, some might say underground. Um, and there, there's, I, I use conspiracy lightly, but there's a lot of conspiracy and delusion around um, what some might consider unity or progress, which I want to get into a little bit later, mm -hmm. but just to focus on the delusion for a moment is dehumanization a form of delusion? Yeah, it's a fundamental delusion. Anytime that you see another person as less than fully human and as anything less than a divine soul, then you are in delusion. The whole thought form of some people are better than others. And usually going along with it is I'm one of the better sort. Uh, you know, I'm one of the star belly sneeches, then you're in delusion. That, that thought form is a poison in the world. And I see it, you know, on every side of the political spectrum, on both sides of the vaccine issue, anytime that we speak contemptuously of, say, the vaccinated as sheep or as idiots, you know, or as group thinkers or whatever, Anytime there's a bit of contempt that that implies that if I were in their situation, I wouldn't be like that. Like really what I'm saying is I'm better than you. And that is a delusion. And when you are in delusion, you will not be an effective agent of, of real change. Mm. You will perpetuate the delusion. And enough of that. You know? Agreed. Yeah. 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 And another line from that essay um, that I really love is an attack on the full humanity and dignity of any human being is actually a threat to every human being. And I love that line because I think it speaks to individual rights, which our audience here um, advocates for many, many of us do, and also individual reverence. So on a spiritual level, remembering that we're all human, we're all some might believe, or I hope many believe that we come from God um, and just reminding us of one another's humanity and breaking free of that delusion of dehumanization. Yeah. And you know, that used to be the left. Right? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Like, like that was, you know, the, the, the ones who believed in the equality of all, that there was no inferior race, that that you know, God doesn't hate gays or hate this or hate that, like all these dehumanizing tropes. Um, those it was the left that was seeking to reverse those. Uh, the 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 people that thought you know that women were equal uh, to men and didn't deserve to be second class citizens. That was the left, and now the tables have kind of turned. Where now the authoritarians are by and large on the left or say that they're on the left. Um, the ones who are, are dehumanizing certain races or groups of people and valorizing others, that's on the left now. Um, even like the glorification of the intelligence services, like uh, the um, I mean, so much of what used to be right is now left and what used to be left is now right. Uh, the, the blind obedience and trust in powerful corporate interests, you know, especially the pharmaceutical industry. I'm like, I, th I thought that question authority was the slogan of the left. And now the left is advocating slavish uh, credulous obedience to authority it is that's one of the one of the most baffling things like i don't know have i become a conservative or am i actually still the same and the left and the right have to some extent switched 
roles here. Yeah, yeah. I think many have been asking that question too, because we live in such an upside down world where um, I guess leaving the left for liberty doesn't necessarily mean leaving the left for the right. It just means acknowledging this shift and this power imbalance and perhaps being brave and doing something about it. Um, and another thing I've noticed that used to be, well, it still is on the left to some extent, but there maybe not as much. Um, is, is the desire to speak of oppression. And I, I think they speak of it a lot, um, but regarding your essay, there seemed to be a lot of pushback to the references of the oppression of the Jews. And as you shared in your follow-up piece, your ancestors are Russian and Polish Jews. Um, and I loved, uh, there was a line, I, I can't quite remember, but when you expressed what inspired you to elevate those images. Um, you said that it was in part due to your lineage, but also I, I suppose there was another part of you um, that called you to, to evoke those examples. So first, how does your lineage of, of your ancestors being Russian and Polish Jews sensitize you to dehumanization? Yeah, I mean, partly because, you know, this branch of my family. So I'm, I'm half Jewish, um, the other half being, you know, I mean, partly Irish, you know, who also were dehumanized uh, in pretty grotesque ways. But, but so like, yeah, this, the, the Jewish heritage came to me in family stories and, and like this, this latent fear that someday they're going to come for us someday they're going to come for me because it happened it happened like my my grandfather fled russia and like hid from a, a mob of of you know murderous peasants in a haystack like they were going around killing the jews like this so this like fear that someday they're going to come for me someday this is going to happen again it's always been like this, this dread on the periphery of my consciousness. And that, so when it starts to actually happen, all of my alarm bells go off. I'm highly sensitive to it. And um, it doesn't matter to me whether the selection criteria for mob violence is Jewishness or some other thing, uh, you know, vaccination status, for example, it doesn't matter. I recognize the same pattern. It's always been part of my psyche. So now some might say that I'm oversensitive to it. One of the criticisms also was that I'm dishonoring the victims of the Holocaust by comparing it to what's happening today. I never said that what is happening today is as bad as what happened you know, in 1940s Germany. But what I'm saying is that similar forces are at work, similar patterns are at work. And even many of the same superficial phenomena are, are, are happening. Uh, the censorship, the segregation, you know, the, the, the um, showing your papers, the control on travel, um, the denunciations, uh, mm -hmm. in some places, even quarantine camps, you know, like all of the superficial regalia of totalitarianism is happening again. And totalitarianism needs a victim subclass to unify around. To, the, you need something so important that you will sacrifice your freedoms for it. And, you know, it, it's so some form of safety, some form of security, which is in Germany too, in, in like hygiene was a big thing. Uh, and, and the germ phobia that was part of uh, Nazi society and even Hitler himself was, was like, uh, was obsessive about germs. That was part of the same way of thinking as unclean people filthy Jews and so forth.
that was also part of the ideology. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I think that this was part of my upbringing to be really wary of this kind of social phenomenon. And I think that quite the opposite of dishonoring the victims of the Holocaust, I think that it honors them by saying, we will not let this happen again. Whether it's about Jews or anybody, we will no longer allow dehumanization and mass murder and mass persecution to happen again. Mm. Yeah. That's a, a potent, it's just, it's a, it's a potent time. What might you say to someone who claims that discrimination against people who are unvaccinated for COVID is not the same as discrimination against someone for their race or religion? Um, well, it's not the same. Um, yeah, it's not the same, but there are some features that, that are similar. Like you can't choose your race uh, or your ethnic background. You can choose whether to be vaccinated or not. So that part's different. Um, and in a way, actually though, it is a religious persecution because and this might get a bit involved, but, but science itself has become the successor to religion or to Catholicism. It is in fact a religion that has its own metaphysics, its own priesthood, its own initiation rituals, its own procedure for finding truth, its own invisible entities that control the world. Like the correlate of spirit would be force, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong force, the weak force. It has special, it has, it says that the world is, is composed of things that only the priests can see. Atoms, molecules with special instruments, sacred instruments. It has healing rituals that are based on its religion. That's what medicine is. It has a whole menagerie of beings, evil spirits that you can't see that cause disease. And, but the priests can tell you all about them. It's very much a religion. And that doesn't mean it's bad any more than any religion is bad. Each religion offers a window onto the truth and opens up powers of the human being and conditions us to a way of being, a way of relating, uh, a whole approach to life. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is a different issue. Maybe you could say each religion reveals some things and obscures others, or each has a profound esoteric truth at its core. The core of Christianity is maybe forgiveness, non-judgment, love. The core of science is humility. Properly speaking, science is a practice of humility. It says, I don't know, so I will ask. That's what an experiment is. So anyway, right now, outside the, the core esoteric truth, an institution has grown that has become frozen, repressive, uh, tyrannical, just as the Catholic Church became over time as it grew up around the core spiritual beauty of Christianity. So the ritual now that we are being offered for inclusion in the, in the ranks of the sanctified brethren is vaccination. And if you do not undergo the ritual, which is also a submission ritual, Obviously, because scientifically, like it's really questionable whether getting vaccinated does any good at all for yourself or society. But 
it is a demonstration masking as well. It's a demonstration of your compliance, of your belonging. Um, so if you don't undergo the ritual, then you are a heretic. It's, it's, a, it's a, and like, yeah, like you could say, oh, no, it's not about that. It's about the numbers. It's about the data. It's about the percentages, you know, and you're going to be 30% less likely and, you, and to transmit the virus and you're going to use less hospital space and therefore it'll be for the good of society. Like you can, you can elaborate reasons why the ritual is necessary, but the same is true of any religion. Like they have their own corpus of reasoning why you have to get baptized, why you have to do whatever it is to belong. Underneath it, it is about belonging. It is about in-group, out-group dynamics. It is about uh, orthodoxy and heresy. It is a religious matter. Yeah, it's, it's the same zealot mentality that I found more on the conservative right, um, or just especially among Catholics. Um, and, and my love to any Catholics who are listening, because I think um, what sets apart this religion of the science, not science, science set free from the article of the is, I think, closer to spirit. Um, but what sets apart the religion of the science these days is it's a secular one it's a secular religion there is no mentioning of god um and so i do find it that more dangerous to society i'm sad to say yeah like if you look at the creation myth of of science it is an impersonal force it is the big bang and if you look at at the teachings of the religion of science as to what the purpose of life is um, and the nature of reality, it is this random chaotic melee of force and mass uh, that has by chance given rise to um, self-interest maximizing genetic units that seek to replicate themselves. So like the basic teachings are um there's no love there there's no intelligence there really in classic newtonian science so we can see the results uh, one of the results is the compulsion to control the world because if there's no intelligence in the world outside of human intelligence if it's just these arbitrary forces of nature, then progress means to impose more and more human order on a world that has none of its own. Whereas if you live in a religious worldview that has a role for God or for spirit, or that says there is an intelligence in the world beyond the human, then no longer is human destiny to impose more and more control on a world that has none, to impose more and more intelligence on a world that has none, human destiny becomes participation in the unfolding of an order and an intelligence that may be far, far beyond our comprehension. So it's no longer trying to get more and more power, but it's becoming more and more sensitive in our listening and more and more deeply in service. And so we can see the ideology of control pervade our culture and especially our politics. And this is known as progress and even feeds into what we call progressivism. Progress, like progressive, what do we mean by progressive? From the get-go, it's been a lot about making government more scientific. So like doing, which means, okay, that's a whole other thing. Um, but basically it converts more and more of life into a cost benefit analysis. Yes. Where you make decisions by the numbers. And it, it puts 
progressivism and safety in the place of God, and it puts a human in the place of God. Um, and rather than progress in the sense of getting creative of how we might move forward, it's it's this incessant drive to, to go forward at any cost. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about the, the theme of safety and then let's go into progressivism because I really want to, mm -hmm. I want to explore that with you too. Um, so safety in a way has become a God and with the mandates becoming more controversial in the US and having them escalate in even our neighbor of Canada, Austria and Germany, Australia, among other places, um, what are some of your concerns as all of this, all of this is playing out? Yeah, isn't it amazing? Um, like, I, I, I've never in my life felt so fortunate to be in the United States. You know, for most of my life, this idea of we're the freest country in the world, you know, didn't really ring true. Like, a friend of mine from China said, do you guys think you're so free? Free to do what? Mow your grass every Sunday, you know? Like, purchase products? Like, but now I feel like like we are pretty much the freest country in the world, aside from maybe Nigeria or something like that. But in the developed world, um, this is as good as it gets. Um, but yeah, the, so as far as safety, um, the worship of safety in our public policy discourse, where every decision is made based on how many people are going to die, how many people are going to get sick, how many people are going to be uncomfortable. That is a symptom of a loss of purpose and meaning. Because on some level, everybody knows that you are not here to survive life. You are not here to make it to the grave as safe as possible. You're going to die. When a society loses touch with that absolute truth that you're going to die, then it starts to make sense to, like, maybe you can avoid death entirely. Maybe you can conquer death. That's the ultimate control, actually. That would be the, the apotheosis of control, to, to master death itself, to become immortal. So on one level, we know that that's impossible. But in many ways, our modern society acts as if it were possible by gearing all of its decisions, collective and personal, around what is going to keep you the safest. The irony, of course, is that the more you play life safe, the less alive you feel. Because life is about taking risks, about exploring your boundaries. You're not here just to, to be as safe as possible. You are here for something. And that conviction that I am here for something means that sometimes I will sacrifice safety for that something. When a society collectively loses touch with why it is here, then individuals also lose touch with their life purpose. A generation or two ago, Western society, especially America, was very clear why we are here. We had what I call a story of the people. The future was going to be awesome, and we were all going to be part of it. And everybody had a contribution to make to this incredible, triumphal future. Now, I'm not saying that we should revive that and once again aspire to space colonies and robot servants and flying cars and cancer cures in a pill, like all that technological utopia. I'm not saying that it was good or bad or accurate or whatever, but I'm saying we had it. And, and many other aspects of ourselves as a people. When there is a collective meaning and purpose to life, individuals pull from that to fashion their own life purpose. Today, we are in a transition where the collective has, has the old story has broken down and a new story is still forming. And in that in-between zone, individuals often feel a lack of purpose. And when you don't know why you're here, 
and who you are, then safety becomes much more important because there's nothing to sacrifice to. So a lot of this obsession with safety is actually symptomatic. It's symptomatic of one, the denial of death, and two, the disintegration of our cultural story of the people. Mm. And in, in that in-between space, we have a myth prevailing that the virus is the villain and that science and progress are the hero to save the day. And why is that myth so believable and, and why is yeah. it flawed? I mean, see, it's like this, this uh, nostalgic desire to recover the glory days of science and medicine when like a generation or it's really almost two generations ago, the story of medicine was this triumphant march from one victory to another to another. All of the dread diseases had been conquered. Really, by 1960, the infectious diseases in the United States were killing. This was even before vaccines, actually, were, were widely used. Uh, diphtheria, tetanus, um, uh, like measles in the 19th century was a mass killer. But by the mid 20th century, very, very few people died of measles. Uh, all the, all the bacterial diseases had been conquered with antibiotics. Like it looked like next to go was gonna be cancer and then finally the common cold. By the impossibly futuristic year of 2000, we would definitely have conquered the common cold. So <clears throat> these were the, the glory days and not just in medicine, but the pace of technology was transforming life. It seemed for the better. And extrapolating from that, people envisioned a utopia. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, and in the social sciences too, like we were supposed to have engineered all of our social problems out of existence and replicate the success of the material science in the realm of economics and politics. That didn't happen either. In most ways, life before COVID even happened, 2019, general levels of happiness, quality of life was worse than it was in 1960. For, not for everybody. For some people, it maybe was a lot better. Uh, you know, Jim Crow ended and so forth. But even that, you know, um, the, the um, gains in, in, in legal rights and civil rights for black people were offset by the disintegration in many places of black communities and the destruction of black businesses. Um, so even there, it's, it's not necessarily, and like look at photographs of how healthy people were in 1960, black and white compared to today. Something isn't right, okay? And now along comes, and, and we don't know what to do about these problems because the mentality of control does not work on the problems of our current time. It doesn't work against allergies, autoimmune diseases, depression, addiction, anxiety. It doesn't work against social diseases. It doesn't work against uh, domestic abuse. It doesn't really work against crime either. You can arrest and imprison a lot of people, but you end up destroying communities and breeding even more crime. So the, the, the mentality of control has not been working. Finally, in 2019, early 2020, finally a problem comes along that the methods of control work against, or at least look like they might work against. So finally, we can gear up the control machine and, and go to tremendous lengths to completely reorganize society to stop a disease that is killing you know, 0.1% of the population. On the face of it, it's absurd. If we cared that much about saving lives, then why haven't we reorganized society to one-tenth the degree that we have to end child hunger. Like starvation kills way more children every year than COVID has killed. 
way more. Why haven't we upended society to do that? Why? Because, well, for various reasons, but one of them is that it's not something where you can find an enemy and destroy or contain the enemy. We are only comfortable with problems that admit to a find the bad guy, kill the bad guy solution. It comes along and ah, now we are powerful. Now we know what to do. There's almost a relief in that, especially among those who are at the administrative pinnacle of the exercise of control. They, on some level, love COVID. And I'm not accusing them of being inhuman. Okay, yeah, they have compassion. But on some level, they're like, great, now we get to use our tools. Mm. Yeah, and, and as we talk about this, I, I try to choose my words carefully because I don't, I don't want to dehumanize the left or leftists, you know, as people. Um, but you've also told me, um, just looking at the, like the big ideas, that there are some potent origins of the left's identification with science as an institution. Tell us more about that. Yeah, like, you know, it, it used to be that, that religion was uh, an instrument to continue oppression, to justify oppression, to justify persecution of various minorities. And science was the liberator of those things. So people who cared about, um, who were compassionate, who cared about equality, who cared about equal rights for gay people and women and so on and so forth, they embraced science, not recognizing when science transitioned as an institution, okay? And I'm not saying that individual scientists are, are you know, authoritarian martinets, but as an institution, science became a new religion. And the, the liberation, the liberating aspect of it transitioned into a rigid orthodoxy that is now firmly allied with the controlling economic and political powers of the world. So it's no longer like the you know, persecuted maverick scientist in the ivory tower trying to bring enlightenment to a society and fighting politics to do that. They are firmly aligned now. And I think that that the, the left, generally speaking, doesn't realize how science has been co-opted. And, and they have this idea that the data is impartial not realizing how deeply manipulated the data is. You know, this has come out a lot in the COVID era, you know, with, for example, the Surgisphere study that was published, was in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the top journals that, you know, that, that debunked once and for all hydroxychloroquine. And it, it was rushed to publication. It was an obviously fake study. Like, it was, it, was, it was a total fabrication and an obvious fabrication. And, and then, you know, when it became so obvious that they had to retract the study, it was, well, here's one bad apple. We don't know how this happened. But actually, it's indicative of an entire industry of data manipulation that, that you won't see much evidence of it in the mainstream media, which is funded by the same institutions that manipulate the data. In fact, it's part of the manipulation, but you don't have to dig that deeply to, to, to say, to, to, to realize that the, that the data from which we are trying to engage in a clash of reason and logic is itself biased. So, the ideal of reason is, has been shifted onto um, shaky ground. Like, and that doesn't mean that the ideal of reason is, is bad, <laughs> but we have to recognize the limits. Garbage in, garbage out. And we have to recognize that the production of knowledge 
is a political process. The choice of what questions to ask in science is political. And then the choice of what to accept as valid data ultimately is political. Hmm. To believe otherwise is a kind of fundamentalism. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's to believe that institutions have our best interest in mind. Um, I think that might be the tension why people, many people can't let go of that belief that, um, that the systems in place are good and healthy and righteous. Um, and particularly like in progressivism, I think there is this movement toward an ideal utopia, a perfectly controlled utopia. Um, and I just, I was just looking at the email you sent me, you said that um, there are assumptions built into progressivism, which rests on a neatly linked, sorry, rests on a certain notion of progress that is innately linked to scientific technological ambition. Um, so perhaps many are progressive in the sense that they want to get creative about moving forward. But like, I think progressivism is about building more and more and more and higher and higher and higher. And, you know, like the Tower of Babel, higher and higher and higher is not necessarily good. Um, so what's going on there? And like, at what point does progressivism, particularly when it's linked to science, uh, become regressive? Right. You know, my, my first book, I called it The Ascent of Humanity. The cover art was a um, painting by um, Peter Brugel, the elder Dutch painter, several hundred years ago of the Tower of Babel, which I understand as a it's a teaching story. It's a metaphor for the attempt to attain the infinite through finite means, the attempt to attain quality through quantity, the attempt to build a tower all the way to heaven. And one aspect of that is the idea that if we can control, label, quantify everything, down to the molecular level, down to the genetic level, uh, we will have a perfect world and a perfect society. We will, if we could only control every neurotransmitter and every neuron in your brain, well, we could make sure that you are happy all the time because it's all a matter of chemistry, right? And if we try that and we give you SSRIs and you're not happy, it means it doesn't mean that control doesn't work. It means that we have not finished the job. There are still things outside of our control. So if we have, um, if we set up surveillance cameras everywhere and tracking devices and uh, kill switches on everybody's car and uh, automatic locks in everybody's house so that if they're contagious, they won't be allowed outside, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we should get much closer to a perfect society because we're controlling more variables and allowing less opportunity for evil to happen. And if for some reason um, it doesn't work, if people start to like attack each other in their own homes, uh, if they, um, you know, get in somebody else's car, even though their car's got it well, we have to tighten the control to eliminate these rogue variables. If something is going on in your body, then we're gonna, we can control that too to make you healthier. It's this whole vision of how to attain heaven, basically. Well, the, 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 the painting is a genius painting because when you look at it, it's obvious that they're never going to get there. The futility of the entire project is obvious. Just in the idea itself, like no matter how high you build, you look up and the sky is just as far away as when you started. Like you can never reach the sky. And paradoxically, the sky, you're already in the sky. The sky begins an inch off the ground. 
we're already in paradise. We don't, and, and, but but we are almost distracted from the paradise that this earth already is, and that life already is, that being already is. Distracted from that by the attempt to find it outside of ourselves, which is one reason I so appreciate the Gospel of Thomas, one of the non-canonical gospels that was edited out of the Bible, that where Jesus says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within you and all around you, among you. It's not, if it were up in the sky, the birds would be closer. You know, if it were down in the sea, the fish would be closer. It's right here. So the the so yeah to go back to to progress this also explains i think a lot of um the motives of somebody like bill gates uh or the technocratic uh potentates of this world who fervently believe that the more power the more control they have the better it will be for the world because they are smart they are rational and they're good and we're going to use this for the good. Yeah, we're going to track every single thing you do, but that's for your benefit. It's to keep you safe. We're not going to try to, to harm you. Of course, we might need to, you know, censor you and silence you and imprison you if you're getting in the way of this project. If you're getting in the way of our power, then you're getting in the way of progress. You're getting in the way of the good. And this is how horrendously evil acts can be committed with the full belief that you're doing something good. This yes, is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that actually, that reminds me of another paradox that I'm seeing within the medical freedom movement. Um, like I was having a conversation with a loved one the other day, and I was like vehemently advocating for medical freedom. And she stopped me and said, well, I don't think like you. I like to live in the unknown. And I was so moved by that paradox between us because I'm like, I'm the one advocating for freedom. Shouldn't I be embodying this idea of living in the unknown? Um, so I, I, like, I'm curious at what point could the medical freedom movement subvert itself and maybe even become somewhat authoritarian? Um, yeah. Anytime that you become identified with yourself as team good, then you're on the road to authoritarianism. Because if you're good, then anything that serves your power is good, by definition. Mm -hmm. Anybody who gets in the way of it is in the way of progress, is in the way of good. Therefore, anything is justified. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the farther you go down that road, the more power becomes an end. It starts as a means, but it becomes an end. Orwell laid this out very explicitly in 1984. The goal of the party is power itself. And they maintain, through doublethink, the self-deception that, of course, it's for the greater good. That's why we want power, but they become conscious of wanting power for the sake of power. And in that famous passage, he says, the future is, you know, a jackboot stomping on a human face again and again and again. Why is that? Is it because of malevolence, a desire to inflict pain for its own sake? No, it is as a demonstration of power. Mm. And, and that is where, that's the, distillation of the mindset of we are this is the party we are good we're the party so anything that helps us even if it is lying even if it is manipulation even if it's you know derision it's for the good cause it's for our side so that is you know the the for me the revolution is not that Team health freedom wins over, you know, team tyranny, and then becomes the new tyrants because they are so full of righteousness. It's that we overturn that whole way of thinking to begin with, 
And part of overturning that way of thinking, it also has, it has ripple effects in every realm. You know, part of it is the, that, I mean, that same way of thinking is what powers war it, and conquest. It's what powers the obsession with germs. It all comes from the good versus evil, uh, progress in control mindset. And I'm not saying that there should never be any kind of control or anything like that. Like birds build nests, they control their environment to some degree. But the worship of control, the delusion that everything can be controlled, that that and that the perfection of control is the goal of life and our destiny, that needs to be overturned. Yes, I, that reminds me of your talk for science, science and non-duality. I was just listening to it um, the other day. It's called The Trap of Being Right. So what might the trap of being right be that vaccine mandates are wrong? Um, Well, at this point, uh, uh, we need a certain amount of resilience um, as a persecuted minority uh, to maintain a different belief system. <clears throat> we need to be very skeptical of the things that we're being told uh, that, um, you know, seek to, to that, that are challenging us. Um, but skeptical does not mean dogmatically resistant to it. Because, you know, like a lot of stuff comes, comes across my telegram feed that would be convenient to believe because it furthers the health freedom narrative, but that actually turns out not to be very sound or not true at all. And if, um, if I am unwilling to exercise skepticism to those things as well, and unwilling ever to examine the beliefs that I have, um, someday it's going to come back to bite me. Like if I go around saying, oh, Pfizer has, this is one thing that came by a month or two ago, Pfizer has a patent for uh, graphene oxide nano devices activated by 5G in the human body. Like that came across, you might remember it. I actually went and looked at the patent and it doesn't say that. It's really about contact tracing using cell phones, like using smart devices. It doesn't say anything about nano devices. Like it could maybe be a step on the path toward that, but it wasn't saying what the breathless telegram posts were saying that it said. So if I had been, well, our side's right, so it must be right, then I would start saying things publicly that would be so easily debunked that, that it would torpedo the credibility of everything that I'm saying. And so that also applies to things that I have accepted as true. Like, do I know that they're true? Am I open to, to looking at that again? And if I'm not, open to examining things that I believe are true. Why would I expect anybody else to be open to it? Especially those on the other side. Mm. So partly I need to establish a principle of human nature, which is actually a kind of a prayer. Mm. Our, our, you know, what the, the stand that we take and, and the person that we choose to be is an offering 
uh, of a principle of human nature. It's saying, here is what I choose for the world to be. This is my ask. I ask that the world come into alignment with who I am being. And that kind of prayer is a lot more powerful than simple verbal prayer. And even more powerful when it is aligned with verbal prayer, as opposed to the kind of verbal prayer that contradicts your actions. Like, I don't think, I think God gets a little bit skeptical of those kind of prayers, you know. But anyway, so, I, I, yeah, so I think that as a matter of example and prayer um, and alignment with a future, it's important to be open to being wrong. Probably you and I are both profoundly wrong about something. And that doesn't mean to question and doubt my direct experiences and my feelings and to think I shouldn't feel something. Feelings are uh, important information. And okay, yeah, maybe I won't, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop it at that for, for the moment. Hmm. The, the mentioning of prayer calls into question what is this new revolution and how might it be spiritual in essence how might how might we navigate duality and polarity in a way that goes beyond politics that transcends man-made spectrums and you know every every corrupt control government was built under the guise of good fighting evil mm -hmm. right so how might we do better this time and co-create a better world with a revolution of love? I mean, I kind of said it already, the, um, it's, it, it is to let go of that way of organizing reality into good and evil, us and them, to understand that we are interconnected, that we are in some sense interexistent, that the evil that I see in the world has an interior reflection, that the things I condemn, I participate in creating. It's a recognition of our power and agency rather than our victimhood in our engagement with reality. Um, it's an understanding of a, such a deep interconnection that anything that we do in the world in some sense we're doing to ourselves and that anything that happens in the world is happening inside of ourselves as well. That when we condemn, then there's something within ourselves that is alienated as well. And that is not the same as allowing evil to continue. There are still times where we fight, where we protect, where we take a stand, where we establish a boundary, where we say no, 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 no more. But we don't need an abstract concept of evil as a justification for doing that. I can say, no, you will stop, not because you're evil, but because this is causing harm. Mm. And that opens the door. If I'm not holding you as irredeemable, then that opens the door for you to change. If I am holding a story that you are just evil to the core and irredeemable, then I'm going to actually be holding you in that. 
there's no invitation to be anything else. And my, my engagement with you is limited then to fighting. If I know you'll never change. Now that doesn't mean that if there's a perpetrator that we just sit back and hope that they will change. But we hold the possibility open. Perhaps finally justice can be set apart from revenge and justice can be made divine. Yes. The equation with of justice and punishment is part of that same old story, part of that same mindset. Yeah. Well, and coupled with that desire for justice is the desire for truth and disclosure. That word is mm -hmm. coming up a lot. What does the desire for disclosure say about the dynamics of the systems in place and the innate nature of the humans that make them up? Yeah. Most of the evil that is happening in the world uh, would not be possible in a condition of transparency. So really disclosure is the revolution. And if we had disclosure, punishment would not be necessary. Like if we had full transparency, most, most evil requires darkness to thrive. It cannot happen in the light of witness, you know? Uh, and this includes even like the petty evils that you and I commit when it seems like no one's watching, when we ourselves are not watching because we're making excuses for it. We're deceiving ourselves in some way. It's not in full transparency. But the, the horrors that are happening today, like, you know, the human trafficking stuff, for example, like, imagine if everybody was watching and the people who are doing that knew everybody was watching. They wouldn't be able to do it. Like, there still might be a necessity for someone to step in and stop them. Like maybe some of them would do it even if their cameras were rolling and the whole world was watching. But generally speaking, something being witnessed is incompatible with a person's own story of themselves as the hero, as the, themselves as justified, as, as a good person. Like people can maintain that story and do terrible things that don't fit that story as long as they create some kind of buffer between their actions and their self-image. And that buffer erodes the more people who see that deception ongoing, the harder it is. It's hard to maintain a vain self-image when everyone around you sees through it, right? You, 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 you self-deception thrives off a general deception. When society denies a certain thing is happening, then it's a lot easier for individuals who are doing that thing to maintain the veneer of propriety to themselves and others. So I guess what I'm saying, like, yeah, deterrence and punishment wouldn't even be necessary if we had transparency. So disclosure is a step into transparency. And I am sure that it will only happen in a context of forgiveness, in a context of amnesty. Otherwise, those who are keeping the secrets will fight to the death to maintain the secrets. Because they're afraid of vengeance. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's no vengeance, then it still might be hard for them to disclose, but it would be a lot easier if they can disclose and then are um, 
even given a second chance hmm. and not punished. And what would you rather have? Would you rather have we punish all the ones we can find, but evil still continues on in the shadows? Or would you rather have none of them get punished, but this all stops? And no justice in the form of vengeance is ever served. They get off scot-free. Would you be willing to accept that they get off scot-free if they can no longer do it anymore? And no more children suffer, and no more people are exploited, and no more ecosystems are ruined. And it all stops. Are you willing to accept that? If it makes it all stop. That's the choice that we are going to be faced with. And often on an individual level, too. You know, when we let go of a vendetta, let go of a grudge, it gets personal. It does get personal. Yep. Hmm. You know, you spoke on Aubrey Marcus's podcast recently um, about understanding this myth of separation and also this disclosure collectively, but also the disclosure of the self, you know, reckoning with these grudges, perhaps, and these separations within the self. Um, and this story of separation has been going on for thousands of years. I think many can see that. And, and you said to Aubrey, you said, once we change that, the world changes and we, and we are in paradise. Do you really believe the coronavirus is the last phase before birthing the new earth? That's up to us. This age of separation will not end by itself. COVID tyranny will not end by itself. We can't sit back and think that an inevitable process will end it for us. The inevitable process, it's a paradox, is that we get fed up with it. We reach the point of courage where what we've been afraid of, I just don't care anymore. I'm doing it anyway. Like, and we reclaim life. And maybe at risk. Maybe the first ones who really stand up or some of the ones who stand up get crushed. There's The risk is real. It's maybe not what the mind makes it out to be, but at some point we have to put life as more important than risk minimization and playing it safe. So will it ever end? Will it end with COVID? Is this like the last doubling down of the uh, forces of control? That's not an objective question. It is a choice. Will it? You know, will it? You decide. We decide what will be. It's a choice. It, it depends on our sovereignty and it depends on those who are willing to step up first, if they are willing to take that risk of being crushed in some sense. So I'm grateful that you're taking that risk. You know, I mean, I've taken the risk in some ways and played it safe in others. And when I have been brave, it's often because I've witnessed somebody else be brave first. Courage is a group project. Courage is a group project. Um, and your recent group project, the video, the short film that you released, A Gathering of the Tribe, it really, it really reached my heart at just the right time. Um, and you read, it, was it the last chapter of your book that you read during that film? It's a story at the la in the last chapter of my book, yeah. Yeah, the, the More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible is the name of the book. And um, I just want to end with one last quote that I think speaks to the mystery of it all and the possible origins of the spiritual crisis and awakening that we find ourselves in. So in, in that film, A Gathering of the Tribe, you say to the rebels and the scapegoats, your intuitive rebellion against the world presented to you as normal will become an explicit quest to create a more beautiful one. 
-hmm. Can this quest be framed as the hero's journey or is it something else? It probably could be, but it's not for me the most useful myth, the hero's journey in this process. Um, the hero gets the credit, you know, the end of the hero's journey is like this big celebration where he gets the, the where Princess Leia pins the medal on his chest. And there are stages of development beyond the hero. The hero is the culmination of the boy, the boy archetype. The hero is a boy archetype. The king does not need that celebration and affirmation and will do the hard thing or the right thing without even witness, without celebration, without approval from anybody. And I think that, that that's why I called that initial essay on COVID, the coronation, that this whole thing has the potential to be an initiation of us individually and collectively into sovereignty, no longer a slave of the past, no longer dependent on external validation, but deeply, deeply in service to the kingdom. Mm. So in, in some ways, it's, it's quite different from the hero's journey, which is about, uh, uh, and I don't wanna trivialize the hero's journey, but what we're being offered is a kind of a maturity. Um, so yeah, I, you might be able to fit it into the hero's journey, but, but that's not the way I've been thinking about it myself. Hmm. The ascent of the kings and queens within us. Yeah, to like really sit on the throne of your sovereignty and take in all of the counsel from all of your ministers. Really take it in, really listen to all of them with their diverse opinions, their different perspectives, and then make your own decision. Mm. You take it all in, you integrate it all, but you choose not, not to please any of them. You're not subject to any of them. That's what it is to be the sovereign. You're not subject to anyone else, but you are in service to all. Mm. That's glorious. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Where can people find you? Mostly I've been publishing on Substack recently. So Charles Eisenstein.substack.org, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's stay in touch. I'd love to do this again. Yeah, yeah, very, it was uh, very stimulating and fun. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Sienna. Be well. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>